Well, a uh, very warm welcome uh, from Tom and me to uh, everyone this morning uh, to this, the first of uh, five webinars dedicated to cargo claims. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. Now, this is our third series of webinars on dry shipping, the first two being on uh, time charters and voyage charters. And we're delighted to uh, welcome as attendees both those acting for cargo interests and those representing carriers uh, and indeed one hope that we have is that uh, any steps taken to increase the understanding across the board of this area of law can only help to resolve disputes amicably. Now our talk will last 45 minutes or so plus questions and um, before we get going uh, there are just a few uh, housekeeping notes uh, to point out and the first is that amongst the handouts in your control panel are three specimen bills of lading uh, a liner bill, a tanker bill, and a dry bulk bill. And we'll be referring to those as we go along. Uh, so please do, if you haven't already, uh, download uh, those and refer to them alongside us. By all means as well, uh, send questions to us via the chat function. The questions will be sent to us uh, uh, just um, Tom and me. Uh, they will be read out anonymously and we'll try to deal with as many questions as we can at the end and we'll also deal with some of the questions that have been sent to us uh, in advance for which many thanks and finally the session is being recorded uh, on youtube not so tom and i can become youtube stars in any way whatsoever i'm not sure that it'll uh, be that popular outside the realms of shipping law but nevertheless it's there for your colleagues or for you if you uh, miss anything during uh, the talk and the slides will also be uh, alongside. So uh, some of you, I'll go one step further back, some of you uh, listening today have worked with us for many years, uh, others of you are less familiar with the firm, so here's a very brief snapshot of, of Burkitt's. When I started at the firm uh, back in 20 uh, or 2007 in fact, uh, when there were just over 200 people. We're now, fast forward 15 years or so, uh, approaching 900 uh, with offices across the east of England and in London. And I think the firm has grown so much, uh, partly due to a very good working culture, but also due to the development of uh, a number of key specialisms of which uh, shipping is uh, a crucial one. And here is the shipping team in all its glory. Uh, we are 14 of us. That's a true rogues gallery in front of you. Um, I don't know what was happening with the beard in the top left. Um, apologies for that. Um, but we have, I don't know how many decades of experience between us. And we specialize in all things uh, shipping, international trade, and marine insurance. And we really live and breathe the sorts of things we'll be discussing today. So on to today's talk and the purpose of today really is to provide an introduction to bills of lading and an overview of cargo claims generally. We'll be looking at the principal issues and make sure you're conversant with the key questions that can arise. And for Tom and me, one of the most important elements with cargo claims is to understand firstly the context, the commercial context in which uh, the claims arise because really we're dealing with a document in a bill of lading that marries international trade and uh, shipping contracts. So it's a very complex document and that complexity can manifest itself very much in cargo claims. And alongside that, to understand the questions that arise. With so many other areas of shipping law, it's easy to know what the questions are, even if the answers are difficult, but in cargo claims, actually, there are bear traps waiting for the uninitiated uh, left, right and centre. So to know what the issues are uh, is absolutely crucial. And the series, as I say, will comprise uh, five talks. The next two will deal with the bills of lading uh, as contracts of carriage. And then we'll look at evidence. And finally, we'll bring together all our practical knowledge uh, of the way in which cargo claims are best handled and the issues that can arise. And we've tried this time to spread the talks over a reasonable period of time 
to allow uh, all of you uh, easier attendance. Uh, and so that's the course in a nutshell. Um, on to today though, and over to Mr Hodges. Thank you, Henry, and a very good morning to you all. Um, I'd like to just extend the same welcome to everyone who's attending today's webinar. Um, it's been a while since we've done any of these shipping webinars, um, and it's great to have you all back on board. Um, as Henry said, the purpose of today's webinar primarily is to set the scene for the series of four webinars that will then follow. Um, and hopefully it will be particularly useful to those of you who are less experienced of handling cargo claims, um, really to assume no, no knowledge and to work from the ground upwards to help you with the building blocks you need to understand the rest of the webinar series and make the most of it. Um, but equally a helpful recap for some of the more experienced uh, listeners for, to the webinar, and hopefully there's something in it for everyone. So without further ado, just to introduce today's webinar and to let you know uh, the structure that we'll broadly be following. Um, first of all, let's just get this going. There we go. Um, I'm just going to um, have a quick look at the history of bills of lading um, and recap on the three functions. Some of you may be familiar with those. Um, and then Henry's going to jump in and have a look at the information on the face of the bill of lading uh, and take you through the, the front sides of the three bills that you've got in your handout pack, uh, pack on the webinar platform. And then I'll come back in and talk about some of the terms that, and, and uh, uh, marks that we see on the reverse side of a bill of lading before considering some key uh, questions that arise in relation to most cargo claims. And then Henry will wrap up um, by looking at some of the key documentation that needs to be considered alongside the bill of lading when handling a cargo claim. So that's the broad structure of today's talk. And just before I go on to the next slide, uh, this is just a warning that there will be a small amount of audience participation over the next couple of slides. So please have your chat boxes at the ready, um, ready to join in. Okay, so your starter for 10, um, chat boxes at the ready, please. Um, who can tell me the Shakespeare play depicted in this film? Um, and just to give you a bit of a steer, uh, obviously we're talking about global trade here in the movement of goods, so perhaps that gives you a helpful clue. Okay, I'm just looking at some of the answers coming in. Anyone else want to have a stab at what this, uh, what the play might be? Good, a couple of good, couple of good answers coming in there. Um, and as some of you have cor correctly identified, this is the 2009 uh, adaptation of A Merchant of Venice. Um, and that's Al Pacino that you can see there playing Shylock. Um, and for those of you who studied GCSE English in the late, uh, late 90s, like I did, you may be reasonably familiar with the play, uh, sufficiently so to know that it was about a merchant called Antonio, slightly hapless merchant, it has to be said, who shipped goods from the West Indies and China, spices and silk to Europe uh, in, in an attempt to make his fortune. Um, things didn't go entirely to plan for Antonio uh, and goods were lost and he came somewhat a cropper um, with the crafty Shylock who you can see in the, in the picture there. Um, but the s slightly serious message behind the, uh, you know, the, the, the light-hearted reference um, is that during the 16th century, a need developed among merchants to find a documentary means um, to return uh, to record the contracts of carriage that they had with ocean carriers and also um, to seek a way of providing a receipt for the goods that they put on board ships, sometimes high value goods um, for long, dangerous voyages at sea. Um, and so was born the Bill of Lading. And in fact, by the time Merchant of Venice was written towards the end of the 16th century, Bills of Lading had probably been in use and circulation for around 50 years in their early primitive form. Okay. There we go. And so jumping forward um, uh, to uh, around 200 years from the date of the Merchant of Venice, here's an example of a Bill of Lading from 1776. Um, and of course, this bill looks quite different at first glance from the types of bills of lading that we're used to dealing with in modern trade today. But actually, on a closer inspection, it has some familiar features, particularly in the wording. And if we look first of all at the top of the bill of lading, you can see that it says shipped by the grace of God in good order and well conditioned by. And then I think it, there it names the carrier. And similarly, if we look halfway down the page, it says being marked and numbered as in the margin and are to be delivered in the like good order and well conditioned at the aforesaid port, etc, etc. And those of you who are familiar with modern bills of lading, 
um, will recognise those words as being common to the use of bill of lading and some of the words that appear on the face of bills of lading today. And that's a reflection of the way that bills of lading and the law that applies to them has evolved through the custom of merchants over 500 years, and lots of it is very well established. Um, now, I had intended to ask you to virtually shout out the three functions of the Bill of Lading, um, but this is a live webinar and it hasn't quite worked like that. So there you go, I'll, um, I'll save you the effort and just uh, there they are on the slide for you um, to see there. Um, and you can see then that the Bill of Lading has now has three well-established functions and these will be familiar to many of you. And those three functions are, first of all, the Bill of Lading is evidence of the contract of carriage. And we say it's evidence of the contract of carriage because very often the bill of lading will not be the full picture and it will rely on other terms, for example, incorporated from a charter party or by reference to limitation conventions in order to form the full contractual picture. So the bill of lading is just the evidence of the contract of carriage. Um, the second is that the bill of lading performs a receipt function. Um, in other words, it's evidence of the goods shipped so that when a shipper hands over the goods to the vessel, it receives a bill of lading as a receipt in return. And then the third function of the Bill of Lading is that it's a document of title. And what we mean by a document of title in a Bill of Lading context is that the Bill of Lading gives the lawful holder the right to immediate possession of the goods. OK, so it's a right to immediate possession as, it, as opposed to a, a, um, a document that shows beneficial ownership of the goods. And the two aren't necessarily the same. But we'll look at all three of these functions in a bit more detail a little later in this talk and in the webinars that will follow. OK, and just moving on um, to the final piece of context setting, really, um, and some of you may recognise these diagrams from some of the early, earlier webinars that we did on uh, charter parties. Um, but I think it's very helpful uh, in order to properly understand how these different types of contracts fit into the overall picture to see it diagrammatically and just to build the picture um, diagram by diagram with the use of these pictures. And so the initial catalyst for um, any um, sale and movement of goods, the reason that we all exist in the industries that we work in, is an initial desire to trade. Okay, so you, in the simplest form, you have a seller of goods and you have a buyer, and so a contract of sale is, is formed, and that later gives rise to a need to move those goods. So in the example you can see on your slide here, the starting point is that there is a sale contract between the first seller and the buyer. And let's say that that was on FOB terms, which means that the delivery of the goods takes place when the seller puts the good goods on board a vessel to be nominated by the buyer. There might then be a subsequent sale of the goods, let's say this time on SIF terms, which means that the buyer is responsible for providing a vessel, delivers the goods by placing them on board its own nominated vessel, um, and then the delivery takes place under that sale contract to the eventual buyer and receiver of the goods. OK, so far, so good. So having agreed the sale of the goods, the SIF, set, the SIF seller, i.e. the FOB buyer, will need to fix a vessel. So via a broker, it will typically go into the market, look for a suitable vessel that complies with the uh, contractual requirements of the sale contracts, and it will fix that vessel. Again, all pretty simple, and we can see there that there's now a charter party in place, a voyage charter between that middle intermediate buyer um, the subcharter in the charter party chain, and then above that sits a number of charter parties all the way up to the head owner or the registered owner at the top of the chain. Again, hopefully all reasonably straightforward. And now to complete the picture, we add in the bills of lading. And we can see here the three functions that are performed by the bills. If we look first of all at the bill of lading on the left hand side here, we can see that it's performing the function of evidencing a contract of carriage between the shipper and the carrier. And then if we look to the references of the bills of lading towards the bottom of the slide here, we can see that the bill of lading is performing its function as a document of title. And you can see that title, i.e. a right to immediate possession of the goods, is being passed from the first seller to the intermediate buyer, and then following the conclusion of a further sale contract with the eventual buyer and receiver of the goods, the bill of lading again passes title, the right to immediate possession of those goods to the final receiver so that it can present the bill at the discharge port in exchange for delivery of the goods. Now, if it weren't for bills of lading, there'd be a strange um, situation that could arise here, namely that the final receiver of the goods could be in a position where it has title in the goods, and it would be the party that would suffer a loss were anything to happen to those goods while they were at sea. 
but it would have no direct contract with the carrier. And as a result of that, if it suffered a loss as a result of something the carrier did at sea, it would have no means, no contractual means to sue the carrier for that loss. And bills of lading and the English law, English law around bills of lading remedies that, that unusual scenario and gives the final receiver, i.e. the final lawful holder of the bill of lading, a way of pursuing the carrier in contract for its loss. And we'll be looking at that contractual relationship um, over the webinars that follow today. Okay, and so having set the context of the bills of lading and had a, ha had a look at how they fit into the overall uh, contractual picture, I'm going to pass back to Henry, um, who's now going to have a look at the representations on the face of the bill. Thanks very much, Tom. So uh, we're now going to walk through uh, three bills of lading essentially and I will look at the front side and that will be divided into two different slides. Firstly we'll look at uh, the evidence of the good ships and then we'll go on to look at uh, the bill of lading as a contract following which Tom will uh, take you through the reverse side. So uh, you have the three specimen bills of lading. Uh, we have as I say uh, a liner bill, a Maersk bill that deals with containerized cargo. Then we have uh, two charter party bills, one of which is a tanker bill for the vessel Axolotl, and another is a dry bulk bill on the Congen Bill 94 form, which is the most common form of dry bulk bill uh, for the vessel called the Interlink Utility. And the layout of bills of lading is almost invariably the same. And to walk through that very briefly, if you look, for example, at the Interlink Utility Bill, uh, and the ship name will be in the middle of that bill, you will see top left, you will have the shipper uh, and the consignee, and then the notified party. The top right, you will have the number of the bill of lading. Then in the middle, you will have a description of the cargo. In the bottom left, you will have a reference to the charter party. The bottom right, you will have words saying that the goods have been shipped in apparent good order and condition, plus an unknown clause, which we'll consider in a moment. And then beneath that, you have the place and date of issue, and then crucially, the signature uh, and the stamp uh, attesting to who the carrier is. So, uh, each bill of lading describes the type and quantity of the cargo loaded and they, that they've been shipped on board. Uh, and as I say, uh, if you look at the, and we'll just use the interlink utility bill for ease of reference. If you look at the bottom right, you'll see the words shipped at the port of loading in apparent good order and condition. And bills of lading also state whether the cargo uh, has been carried on deck in some instances. Now, for tanker bills or liquid cargo bills generally, that's never going to be relevant for obvious reasons. And container bills also never stipulate whether the goods are carried on deck. But that's a crucial thing in relation to uh, bulk cargoes, uh, dry bulk, because where goods are carried on deck and there's a statement saying that they're carried on deck and that's permitted, the carrier is entitled to insert a clause in the bill, as is done in this bill, um, the carrier not being responsible for loss or damage, howsoever arising, uh, stating that there is no liability uh, for cargo carried on deck. And that's permitted under English law because the Hague and the hague Visby rules, which we'll look at very briefly in a moment, do not cover deck cargo. So, moving on, each bill states that the cargo has been carried or shipped, I should say, in apparent good order and condition. And that's invariably the case. But those words are not a contractual promise. They're nothing more than a prima facie representation of fact. Now, sorry for using Latin, but what I mean by that is it's a starting point, but not in any way conclusive. And the consequence of that is that bills invariably contain words limiting the binding nature of the description. And what you find uh, in just about every single bill of lading is some form of what we call unknown clause. And if you look again at the interlink bill, you will see in the bottom right the words 
weight, measure, quality, quantity, condition, contents, contents and value, unknown. And those words are given effect under English law. And what the effect is, is that the carrier is saying, I have been provided these goods by the shipper. I can see their apparent condition. Beyond that, I do not know what the weight is or the quality or the condition. And so I'm telling you, it's unknown to me. And as a result of that, bills of lading almost invariably have no real evidential value except that the goods have number one been shipped and number two were in apparent good order and condition when they were shipped. And in turn, the effect of that is uh, where a cargo claim is brought, the first hurdle for cargo interests is to adduce evidence setting out the quantity, if it's a shortage, or the condition, if it's a quality or, or, or damage uh, issue uh, of the goods when they were shipped. And that therefore involves evidence outside the bill because the bill itself is a very limited um, evidential value. Now, there's a really important exception to that, on the other hand, where a master is aware of the actual condition of the cargo uh, on loading, he can't rely uh, on the unknown clause. And the same is true if a master is aware of a certain quantity that has been loaded that may differ from the quantity stated in the bill, if provided by the shipper. And what the master has to do in those circumstances is to clause the bill. And clausing is simply writing in manuscript on the bill, uh, setting out what the master disagrees with in relation to the description. So, for example, a really simple example, uh, cargo loaded wet. Uh, that is something that the master, if he sees, has to state. And the consequence, if he doesn't, is dramatic. The goods will be deemed to be uh, loaded conclusively in the condition stated on the front of the bill if the master fails to clause about something that he knows is wrong in terms of condition or quantity. And that can have huge implications. We had a case involving 8,000 tons of sugar uh, a couple of years back, uh, of which 2,000 was loaded in really bad condition at Santos due to a fire, a massive fire, in a sugar warehouse. The cargo was damaged by both the smoke from the fire and the fire water to extinguish it. Uh, and that smoke uh, damage and the wet damage, so the cargo interests argued, was very visible. But the bill wasn't clawed. And $2 million worth of damage later and a, a four day hearing later, the tribunal came to the conclusion, having heard witness and expert evidence, that yes, the damage was apparent and the master should have clawed the bill, but didn't, with the result that the carrier was not able to argue that the damage occurred pre-shipment, even though as a matter of fact, it did. And so the carrier was liable uh, for the $2 million claim for pre-shipment damage. Just moving on now to the contractual considerations. Uh, there are a number of points um, to look out for uh, in this context. And the first thing to contemplate is what terms govern the bill of lading. And we describe bills of lading as uh, documents that evidence uh, or contain the contractual terms because very often, uh, or in fact, I should say, invariably, bills of lading will also incorporate other terms and conditions, such as the Hague or Hague-Bisbee rules uh, or um, charter party terms. And so we'll look at those now and indeed uh, then the parties to a bill of lading contract. So I put down the word geography there, which might sound a, a curious thing to write in this context, um, but it's relevant for the following reason. One of the key elements of bills of lading is uh, the incorporation of Hague or Hague-Visby uh, rules terms. And for those of you not familiar with the Hague or Hague-Visby rules, uh, by way of very brief summary, uh, they are very similar. The Hague-Visby is a later version of the Hague rules. 
and they exist in order to codify uh, and uh, clarify the relationship between a carrier and uh, a cargo interest. Um, the Hague Rules came about actually in 1924, the Hague Visby in the uh, late 60s, 1968, and there are two obligations primarily under each. The first on the part of the carrier, that is. The first is to exercise due diligence before and at the beginning of the voyage in relation to the seaworthiness and cargo worthiness of the ship. And the second is uh, to uh, properly and carefully load, so keep careful and discharge the cargo. And in exchange for that, the carrier benefits from a one year time limit and in the Hague rules, a package limit of £100 gold value per package. And we'll look at what gold value means in a future talk. And in the Hague Visby rules, a slightly more generous limit of uh, two special drawing rights, which is, uh, if you like, based on a basket of currencies uh, per kilo or 666.67 SCRs um, per package, whichever is higher. And so what you've got are two sets of rules, one of which is a later version of the other. And uh, the UK is only a signatory these days to the Hague Visby rules. Um, and that has an important effect. The effect being that if the geography is right, then the Hague Visby rules will apply compulsorily to any bill of lading. And when I say what the geography uh, is right, um, when the geography is right, what I mean is if the goods are loaded or if the bill of lading is issued in a Hague Visby signatory country, the rules will apply compulsorily as a matter of English law. And so you don't need to look on the backside to see what the clause paramount says. And looking at the bills we have here, we've got a bill of lading issued in the Ukraine, which is not a signatory, a bill um, and the cargo loaded in Ukraine. We have another bill uh, which was issued and the cargo loaded in China, not a Hague Bisbee signatory. And then the third bill, the tanker bill, the axolotl bill, was uh, issued in Greece. And Greece is a Hague Bisbee signatory, so the Hague Bisbee rules would apply regardless of what the bill of lading says. If the rules don't apply, the Hague Visby rules don't apply compulsorily, the effect of most clause paramounts on the uh, reverse side of a bill of lading uh, will be to uh, apply the Hague rules uh, instead contractually, the Hague rules being slightly more um, beneficial in terms of weight limits or package limits to the owner. So that's the, the, the geography. Then we have uh, a reference to charter body terms. And if you take the interlinked utility bill of lading, you will see in the bottom left, there's a reference to freight payable as per charter party dated 4th February 2017. And then on the reverse side, very briefly, there'll be a clause one, a clause seeking to incorporate the charter party uh, the date of which is referred to on the front side. Now, the effect of that is uh, relatively clear in that the terms of the bill, uh, sorry, of the charter party will, will be incorporated insofar as they relate to loading, stowage and discharge. And where there are express words, also the law and uh, arbitration or jurisdiction clause will be incorporated. But sometimes, as with the axolotl bill, uh, you have a bill of lading that doesn't set out the date of the charter party. And that creates a difficulty. Uh, and the question that arises is, which, if any, charter party terms are incorporated, or the terms of which charter party are incorporated? And the answer, as a matter of English law, is uh, that the lack of date is no bar to incorporation whatsoever. English courts will try to find a way of incorporating the charter regardless of the lack of date. And there are two rules here essentially that the courts will apply. And these follow uh, two cases called the Heidberg and the San Nicolas. And the first rule is that uh, where there is a time charter and a voyage charter, the terms of the voyage charter will be incorporated into the bill because those are the most relevant terms in the context of a bill of lading, time charter not being 
a contract of carriage like a voyage charter, but a contract for the hire of the ship. And the second rule is that whether a, a number of different voyage charters, it will be the head voyage charter uh, that is incorporated. So onto the parties, and uh, the key question that always arises is who is the contractual carrier? In other words, who has signed the bill of lading or who has it been signed on behalf of um, attesting to uh, themselves as the party responsible for the carriage of the goods? And you always have to look at the bottom right of the bill as a starting point, because that is the signature box. And as many of you will know, there's a key case called the Starsin at the turn of uh, the century, um, which looked at precisely this issue and said, where there are terms on the back side that conflict with the front, you simply look at the front side uh, to uh, allow that prevalence. And you look at the signature box in the first instance. And with the two bills we have that are charter party bills, they both have been signed by or on behalf of the master. And in those circumstances, English law takes the view that uh, the carrier is the employee of the master, and that will generally be the registered owner of the ship, with one exception. And the exception is where there is a demise charter in place. Now, for those of you not familiar with demise charters, they're essentially uh, charter parties for the hull and machinery of the ship, but without any crew being employed. So the demise charterer employs the crew, including the master. So if the master signs the bill, he's signing on behalf of the demise charterer. And that can create difficulties because it can be really hard to find out whether uh, a ship is actually demise chartered. And the best way of doing so generally uh, is simply to ask the question of the registered owner uh, along the lines of, of um, stating that um, unless you are told to the contrary, if you're the cargo interest, um, you will proceed on the basis that um, there is no demise charter or ask the PI club. And with liner bills, on the other hand, uh, the position tends to be simpler. Uh, Maersk, in inveterate style, uh, signed simply for the carrier, Maersk Line AS. So that is your contractual carrier. And the contractual carrier needs to be distinguished uh, occasionally from the actual carrier. In other words, the party who physically is carrying the goods. And that will be, if different from the bill, the registered owner or the demise charterer. So, for example, under the Maersk bill, if the ship in question wasn't owned or demise chartered by Maersk, then you would have a claim against Maersk Line AS under the bill of lading and a separate claim uh, in tort or bailment against the actual carrier. Right, on to the either very simple or very thorny issue of who uh, the uh, relevant cargo interest is. And this really is about who is entitled to bring the claim. And this is where bills of lading are unique and sometimes very complex. What bills need to achieve essentially is to marry the sale contract and the contract of carriage, which is a tall order. And as many of you will know, under English law, generally, there is a notion of privity of contract, which means uh, a, part, a contract will have defined parties at the outset, but not with bills. They do a totally different thing. The party uh, who is um, entitled to claim under the bill as a contracting party at the start will be the shipper who is the seller of the goods, who ships the goods. But then the contract passes to the buyer, who is the consignee or potentially uh, an ultimate end or C of the bill, uh, who receives the goods. But the carrier, meanwhile, uh, also needs to know who to deliver the goods to. So you've got all these different uh, potential uh, interested parties. And the way English law deals with it uh, sounds like a simple expedient, but can be complex depending on what the documents show. And English law says that the party uh, with the right to demand delivery of the goods and who can sue if the goods are lost or damaged is the lawful holder of the bill of lading. And this is all enshrined in uh, an act called the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act 1992, which 
I think is a really badly worded act, if I'm honest. I think it's hard to navigate and you need a, a wet towel around your head to get through some of its niceties. But the overarching point is a simple one. You need to find out who the lawful holder of the bill of lading is. And as I say, that's initially the shipper, um, but then rights are transferred either to a named consignee um, where the bill is a straight bill. And so, for example, with this Merck bill of lading, the position is really simple. As long as the bill has been physically transferred to the named consignee Worldwide Fishing, Worldwide Fishing would have the right to pursue a claim under that bill. If, on the other hand, uh, the bill hadn't been transferred, for example, where damage is noted uh, at the load pause, then the shipper has the right to claim. And then under uh, the other documents, um, the other bills of lading, you will see that those are issued um, firstly to the order of a named consignee, so that's a to-order bill, and then secondly uh, with the interlinked utility it's simply consigned to order and that makes a bearer bill. Uh, now there are real complications potentially with to order bills and bearer bills and I'm glad to say it will be Mr Hodges not me who will be looking at those. Thank you Henry. Um, well as Henry says one of the key features um, of the Bill of Lading is its capacity um, in, the, in the right circumstances to transfer rights from one party in the sale contract chain to the next. Now, this is only possible um, in relation to two order bills and bearer bills. Um, and as Henry mentioned a moment ago, the way that we identify um, whether a bill is a two order or bearer bill is by looking at the consignee box and seeing whether the consignee is named as two order. Now you might just see the words to order or you might see to, to order of a specified party. Um, and if we have a look at the bill, uh, the bills of lading in your packs, first of all. Um, so in relation to the Maersk line bill of lading, which comes up first, you can see that the consignee is named as worldwide fishing and there's no reference to the words to order. So that's the end of the inquiry, the end of the line for the Maersk bill. It's not a to order bill and therefore it's not possible to pass rights under the bill. Um, if we then move on to have a look at the Axolotl bill, um, you can see on the face of the bill of lading, it says that it's to the order um, of Totsa Total Oil Trading SA. Um, therefore, it is a two order or a negotiable bill. Uh, the party with uh, title under that bill of lading in the first instance when it's issued will be Totsa Total when they take physical possession of the bill of lading. And they will then be in a position, if they so choose, to trade on that bill and pass the rights under it to subsequent uh, endorsees. And then if we move to have a look at the third bill, the interlinked utility bill, as Henry said, that's uh, simply a to order bill. There is no named consignee. And the effect of the words to order in that scenario is that the bill will be consigned to the order of the shipper. Um, so the uh, party with title to sue in the first instance with possession of the bill uh, will be the shipper, which is uh, ILTA Agribusiness DMCC. OK, so that's the way that the face of the bills deal um, with the possibility of the passing of rights. Um, and then in terms of how rights are passed under the bill, there are two things that need to happen. The first of which um, is there needs to be an endorsement on the reverse side. And the second of which is that physical possession of the bill of lading needs to be passed. Um, so let's just go on with this slide now um, and have a look at some of these features. OK, so in relation to an endorsement, an endorsement is a stamp or signature on the reverse side of a bill of lading, which acknowledges the endorser's agreement to the passing of certain rights, including title, i.e. the right to immediate possession uh, and the right to sue the carrier under the bill of lading. And once those rights have passed to the subsequent law of holder, uh, sorry, excuse me, the, the subsequent lawful holder, um, the previous lawful holder loses those rights as against the carrier and in relation to the goods. An endorsement can be in blank or it can be to a named endorsee, and we'll have a look at that in a minute. 
And as I say, it must be accompanied by transfer of physical possession and intention to be effective. So there is a, a anti-fraud measure um, in COGSA 92 that says if, if um, bills of lading fall into the hands of the wrong person, um, then the transfer of rights under those bills will not be effective. Um, and in relation to bearer bills, um, bearer bills require no endorsement in order to pass the rights. They simply uh, require the transfer of physical possession of the bill with intention from one party to another, except uh, in relation to the initial uh, transfer of rights from the shipper um, to the first subsequent end or C. And the reason for that, as I've just explained, is that the shipper is actually held to be named as the two order um, consignee in the first instance under a two order bill. So let's have a look at how uh, endorsements work in practice. And just going back to your uh, pack of bills of lading. Um, so as I say, with the Maersk line bill, it's a straight consigned bill, not capable of transfer by endorsement. So we can put that to one side. If you see an endorsement on the reverse side of a straight bill, it's ineffective and you can forget it. If we then have a look at the Axolotl bill, uh, which is the Totsa Total uh, bill, if you have a look at the second page of that bill of lading, you can see on the back page that there are two stamps that actually look very similar to one another. Um, and if we look first of all at the stamp at the top of the page, we can see that that is a stamp. Um, and if we look at the printed text, it says um, delivered to the order of, forget the written text for the moment. And then it's signed by Totsa Total Oil Trading SA, who are, as we know, the two order consignee on the face of the bill. And then it says delivered to the order of Total Oil Asia Pacific PT Limited. So that is an effective endorsement in favour of, uh, of Total Oil Asia Pacific, transferring the rights under the bill from uh, Totsa Total Oil Trading SA to the Asia Pacific entity. So provided there is then physical uh, transfer of physical possession of the bill of lading as well, that will be an effective means of transferring the rights under that bill of lading. And then if we look at the further um, representation at the bottom of the bill, we can see that there is a further endorsement there uh, in favour, uh, made on behalf of uh, Total Oil Asia Pacific, in favour of the other Total entity uh, that's written in manuscript in the endorsement. So looking at this bill of lading, provided physical possession has also transferred, the likelihood is that Total, uh, I, and I'm not sure what that word beginning with L is actually, but that the, the manuscript Total entity on the second endorsement will be the lawful holder of the bill of lading with rights under that bill. And then if we turn to the inter interlinked utility bill of lading, so remember this is two order, which means that it's consigned to the order of the shipper in the first instance. So if there are endorsements on the reverse side, the first thing we would expect to see is an endorsement from the shipper in favour of the next end or C. Now, if we turn over here, there are two endorsements on the re reverse side, and the instinctive thing to do is to look at the one perhaps on the left first, or, or the one, or perhaps there's one at the top of the page and one at the bottom. But it's not always that simple and quite often um, you have to consider the endorsements in context to actually try to make sense of them. And if we actually look at these two endorsements, if we look at the one on the right hand side um, of the, the back side of the um, interlinked utility bill with the blue circular stamp on it, we can see if you read the writing behind the stamp that it is actually endorsed for and on behalf of the shipper and you can just about read uh, ILTA Agribusiness DMCC and then there's a stamp confirming the endorsement. And you can see the words at the top that it's to the order of Guarantee Trust Bank. So what appears to have happened here is that the bill of lading has been endorsed to the bank, presumably pursuant to the terms of a letter of credit or the finance, uh, agree, uh, the fi finance arrangements for the sale of the goods. Um, and then subsequently, we can see on the left-hand side, there's a further endorsement. You can see at the bottom of the stamp that the stamp is from Guarantee Trust Bank, uh, and it says delivered to the order of Crown Flour Mills Limited. So it appears that the ultimate endorsee under this bill is Crown Flour Mills Limited. And as long as physical possession of the bills has also passed, then Crown Flour Mills are likely to be the ultimate party, A, the ultimate receiver of the goods entitled to take delivery, uh, and B, the, the lawful holder of the bill with rights under it, including the right uh, to sue the carrier uh, for any loss or damage to the goods. Now, there'll be further talks uh, on these on endorsements and COGSA 92 later in the webinar series, but hopefully that gives you a flavour uh, of the way that endorsements work on the reverse side of a bill. Um, just a quick note on the timing of endorsements, and particularly because there's been a question raised on this subject. 
Um, so t section 2.2 of COGSA 1992 deals with spent bills um, and a spent bill refers to a bill of lading that exists in circumstances where the um, cargo has been discharged from the vessel and delivered and in those circumstances a bill of lading is no longer uh, capable of conveying rights on a subsequent end or sea. So any attempt to endorse the reverse of the bill and pass physical possession will be ineffective in passing rights to anyone else once delivery has taken place. Now that doesn't always apply in circumstances where a sale contract has been entered into prior to the delivery of the goods. Okay, so let's take this sequence of events. The vessel is approaching the discharge port. Before she reaches the discharge port, a further sale contract is concluded in respect of the goods on board. The goods are then discharged, and then after discharge, the bill of lading is endorsed in favor of the final receiver. And in those circumstances, it is still possible to transfer rights under a bill because the bill will not be spent until it's in the hands of the receiver and that receiver has taken delivery of the goods. OK, but generally in relation to spent bills after the um, cargo has been discharged, then unless there's that situation with the final sale contract, the bills will be spent uh, and it's no longer possible uh, for rights to be passed under them. And if you're, particularly if you're a carrier defending a cargo claim and you're suspicious that the claim may be being advanced in the name of a cargo interest or a party on the cargo side um, that actually is trying to pursue a claim under a spent bill, um, then you should make inquiries um, and you should seek copies of sale contracts to corroborate the, uh, the, the timing of the um, uh, discharge of the cargo and the endorsements on the reverse side of the bill. Um, and if you're suspicious that there, um, this could be a spent bill, then you may have a defence to the claim. So that's an important qu inquiry to make in those circumstances. And then just a few kind of handy tips to consider with endorsements. Um, so first of all, does the evidence of the endorsement show that the claimant has title to sue? Um, if a bearer bill, if it's a bearer bill, was it initially endorsed to the uh, by the shipper? Because if the shipper hasn't endorsed it, and if there's a chain of endorsements without an endorsement from the shipper, it may be that the rights are still vested in the shipper. Um, was the bill spent before the endorsement was made? This is what we've just discussed. So in relation to that first bullet point and the third bullet point, um, if, you're, if there are questions over the endorsements on the reverse side and the timing of those endorsements, um, then questions should be asked and, and further documentary proof should be, uh, should be provided in order to corroborate the position in relation to the endorsements and the timing. And has physical transfer of the bill of lading taken place, A, and in good faith and on the shared intention of the parties, B? OK, and these points arise in relation to possible time bars and security, and, and particularly on the time bar point, of course, if, the, if it turns out that the wrong um, claimant has actually commenced the proceedings, um, the relevant time bar has risen and passed, um, then it may be that the, the time, the, the claim in those circumstances could be, could be time barred. So it's, you know, it can be an important uh, defence for a carrier to raise uh, should they be suspicious of the circumstances. OK, and then just very briefly, because I can see time is ticking on, um, the other um, point to note on the reverse side of the bill of lading uh, are the terms of the contract that are evidenced by the terms on the reverse side. So just briefly going back to the Maersk liner bill, um, a key feature, a typical feature of a liner bill is that the um, terms of carriage, the terms of the contracts of carriage will often be written out in longhand on the reverse side of the bill. Now the terms on the uh, reverse side of this Maersk bill aren't particularly legible, but you can see there that there's a set of contractual terms. You can just about make out in the bottom right hand corner that there's a law and jurisdiction provision. Um, and this is a typical, uh, typically what you would see in relation to a liner bill. As Henry mentioned, the other two bills are charter party bills, um, and you see on their reverse sides um, that they have words of incorporation for a charter party. Um, now there's a key difference between the two charter party bills that we have in rela relation to the way that they incorporate the terms of a charter party or the wording that they have on their reverse side. And that is at clause one, um, the first bill of lading, which is the axolotl bill, has the words, all terms and conditions, liberties and exceptions of the charter party dated as overleaf are herewith incorporated. Full stop. The other bill of lading, which is for the Interlink Utilities case, um, goes on to also say, uh, so it incorporates the terms and exceptions of the charter party dated as overleaf, including the law and arbitration clause are herewith incorporated. Now that reference to the law and arbitration clause is very important because without 
the reference, the express reference to the law and arbitration clause, any law and arbitration clause from the charter party will not be effectively incorporated as a matter of English law. Okay, so in those circumstances, um, you wouldn't be able to incorporate the law and arbitration clause from the charter party, and you would have to make further inquiries to determine what the applicable law and jurisdiction are. And we'll deal with those points in more detail in subsequent talks. The other common feature on the reverse side of a bill of lading, and Henry referred to this as well, uh, is the clause paramount. And the effect of a clause paramount essentially is to incorporate the terms of a particular limitation convention, such as the Hague or Hague-Visby rules. Henry's already explained the basis on which the Hague-Visby rules can apply on a compulsory basis. And where this is not the case, the clause paramount on the reverse side of a bill um, will often incorporate either the Hague or Hague-Visby, commonly the Hague rules, um, because they're more carrier friendly uh, on a contractual basis. Uh, and we can see uh, clause two on the reverse side of both the um, interlinked utilities and axolotl bills of lading, you can see a clause paramount that has the effect of uh, incorporating the Hague rules. Um, and again, that will be looked at in more detail in a later talk. Uh, the third, third bullet point on that slide is liner terms. And as I've already, already said, um, the liner terms typically apply in container trades um, when, it, when a, a large line like MERS, MSC, et cetera, um, are, are operating a liner service. So that's all I want to say about the uh, reverse side of the bills of lading. Um, and as I say, that just gives a flavor really of some of the, the content of some of the webinars that are going to follow. And then just to start to draw matters to a close, um, we have had a think about some of the key questions that um, need to be considered in relation to virtually every cargo claim. So these are just some general thoughts, really. Um, so the first point to consider is what law and jurisdiction apply. And as I say, you have to be slightly careful not to slip up on um, the omission of the words law and arbitration on the reverse side of a charter party bill. Um, what document does the claim lie under? Do you have to bring the claim under the Bill of Lading? Do you need to bring the claim under a charter party? Do you have a choice? Are you obliged to do one or the other? Um, and we'll look at that in a later talk. Who is entitled to claim? Henry talked earlier about the potential pitfalls of actually establishing who is the lawful holder and the party entitled to bring a claim under a Bill of Lading. Who does the claim lie against? What's the identity of the carrier? Is the bill signed by the master? Is it signed on behalf of charterers? Is there a demise charter in place that could change the position? And what assets do they have? If you're a cargo interest and you're pursuing a claim against a carrier, is there actually a, a means of enforcing an arbitration award or a judgment? Can you obtain security against the vessel from a P&I club? What evidence is available at the load and discharge ports? The burden in the first instance will be on the cargo interest to prove that the cargo was loaded in good condition and discharge damage. So if you're a carrier, the first step in defending any cargo claim is to put the cargo claimant um, to, to proof on those points. What is the applicable time limit? Usually where Hague, Hague, Visby apply, um, there will be a one year time limit from the completion of discharge or from delivery of the goods. Um, so if you're bringing a claim, you need to make sure that you're comfortably within that time limit. Uh, if you're defending a claim, then you need to scrutinise carefully whether there could be a time bar defence, because for whatever reason, the claimant has missed the time bar. And finally, again, if you're a carrier defending a claim, are you entitled to benefit from a package or weight limitation under a particular um, limitation convention? Um, Hague, Hague, Visby rules, again, are the, the two most likely to apply here. All of these considerations need careful consideration at the outset of a claim um, and missing out, missing out or getting any of these slightly wrong um, can have um, you know, important consequences for the claim or indeed the defence of the claim. OK, and I'm now just going to pass over to Henry to um, have a look at some of the key documents that go alongside bills of lading. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. So key documentation. Uh, this essentially is a list of uh, those elements that you will need to see in uh, every single case, and I will run through it um, quickly. In the first instance, you will want to see the charter party. And the point to draw out here is that even if the consignee, the person um, or endorsee uh, that is entitled to claim doesn't have the charter party, that's no bar to its incorporation whatsoever. So that can be problematic. 
Secondly, and we really uh, reinforced this already, you need to see the condition and the quantity on loading because the bill just doesn't provide any such information. And the initial burden is very strongly on cargo interests to do that. And similarly, uh, cargo interests have to establish that the cargo has been lost or damaged, self-evidently, at the discharging pause. And the real point to make here is that cargo interests do not have to establish the cause of the loss or damage. Uh, that is uh, under Volcafe, so relatively recent case law, for the carrier to, to show why they are not responsible in those circumstances. Subrogation form can be very important because when you start proceedings uh, as a cargo interest or when you receive proceedings uh, as a carrier or PI club, uh, you clearly have to know um, whether or not the right parties have uh, been named. And subrogation forms are crucial to that end. English law looks at uh, the rights under insurance policies as subrogated. Uh, which means that the insurers do not have to be named uh, as claimants, whereas most continental legal systems and uh, across the world, in fact, generally look at rights being assigned uh, under an insurance policy when the policy claim is settled, with the result that it's necessary to name the insurers. And by insurers, from an English law perspective, I mean all of the insurers, not just uh, the lead underwriter. And then finally, the letter of undertaking. Uh, where there is a uh, an LOU, it's absolutely crucial to consider very carefully what it says in relation to the identity of the carrier, who the beneficiaries are to the LOU, uh, and what it says indeed in relation to law and jurisdiction, because letters of undertaking can uh, and very often do change or vary the terms of the bill of lading and English law will give effect to those variations. So that is the checklist and that brings to an end uh, this introduction to cargo claims. Uh, we will go into more detail on all of these matters in due course but before we finish uh, we will answer just a couple of questions that have come through. Uh, Tom if I could put one question to you um, the question is as follows. If a claimant lodges claims uh, for breaches of uh, bill of lading, negligence and bailment simultaneously, can the claimant be awarded damages for all three claims? Thanks, Henry. Good question. Um, the short answer to the question is no. Um, the uh, a claimant in a cargo claim or indeed um, the vast majority of claims under English law can only recover its loss once um, on the compensatory principle which is to put the, um, the innocent party who suffered the breach in the position it would be in had the uh, contract been properly performed. Um, it may be sometimes, as the question implies, that a claimant will have an option um, of routes in terms of how it pursues the carrier. But for example, if a claimant were to decide to pursue a claim in bailment as opposed to a claim under a bill of lading, uh, usually the position is that the claim in bailment is subject to the terms of the bill of lading. In other words, it's called a bailment on terms. So, for example, it's not a means to get round a one-year time bar um, by trying to rely on the six-year time bar that applies in tort claims. Um, so, yeah, the, the short answer to the question is no, you can only recover your loss once. Um, and Henry, a question for you. Um, when does a master need to clause a bill of lading for cargo difference at loading? Um, is there a prescribed rule in terms of it's when the difference is 0.3%, 0.5% or more? <laughs> um, interesting question. That That's likely to relate to liquid cargo claims uh, where there tends to be uh, an in-transit uh, allowance or a trade allowance and it varies from uh, trade to trade of between 0.2 or 0.5 percent for shortage claims at discharge of liquid cargoes uh, due to the cargo clinging to uh, the uh, tank sides uh, or due to evaporation and so often you see these small shortage claims arising but in terms of the master at the load port if the master is faced with shoreside evidence uh, saying one thing and shipside evidence saying another and the higher figure is uh, referred to in the bill of lading the master is very well advised to clause the bill to state that he doesn't accept that and as far as he's concerned uh, there is a shorter uh, or smaller quantity that is loaded. 
uh, to avoid being held liable at discharge as against the higher figure. Thank you, thank you Tom. Uh, I think that's all we have time for today. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for uh, uh, listening today, and uh, we look forward to uh, our further discussions in the subsequent webinars. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you.